I'm Rita Rudner. Welcome to my HBO special. I'm very excited about it. The audience is waiting. The crew is ready. Unfortunately, I can't decide what to wear. One minute, Miss Rudner. I've narrowed it down to two outfits. Okay, here's the first one. This is my favorite blouse. And please keep in mind that red is a good color for me. Now, I put it with these beige slacks. These are great, lightweight, washable, no iron. My only fear is that light colors can make me look a little hippie. Okay, here's the next one. Now with this, we have a whole different set of problems. It's my other favorite outfit, and though it does make me look thinner and I am comfortable in it, it's black. And black doesn't exactly scream comedy. However, I do have these. And these might just liven it up. So there you have it. The phone lines are open. If you like the red, please dial 555-R-E-D-D. If you're leading towards the black, 555-V-L-A-K. We're ready, Miss Rudner. Please, I need your help. From San Francisco, fabulous Fillmore. exciting to be doing another HBO special. Uh, I did one last year. It was called Women of the Night. And, oh, that's okay. And this year it's called One Night Stand. <laughs> Next year, Sluts Tell Jokes. <laughs> so much has happened to me since the last special, though. I got married. I know, it was scary. It's a very scary thing to get married. We didn't like the ceremony. We changed it. We didn't like for better or for worse. We liked for better or forget it. We made a terrible mistake. You know what we did? We went to Las Vegas on our honeymoon. And it's a nice place, except they gave us one of these rooms that has a mirror over the bed. And it didn't help matters. We just kept looking up and thinking, God, we're fat. <laughs> Gradually, we totally lost interest in each other. But more men are getting married now. I guess it's kind of dangerous out there. They kind of have to choose between marriage and death. <laughs> I guess they figure at least with marriage they get meals. <laughs> and then the jokes on them because they get married and find out we don't cook anymore. <laughs> I met my husband in Australia because I couldn't find a man in this hemisphere. <laughs> A shortage. You know, they came out with that study in Newsweek last year. It said that if you're a single woman over 30, there's a less than 20% chance you'll ever get married. They should do another survey. They should find out how many women over 30 ever bought Newsweek again. <laughs> My husband and I, we commuted from America to Australia for two years. We have enough frequent flyer miles now to orbit Saturn. <laughs> it's a very long trip. There. You know one thing you should never do on a long trip? I learned this the hard way. Never start up a game of peekaboo with a child sitting in front of you. <laughs> this is a game that has no ending. The kid turned around. I finally just grabbed him by the bib. I said, look, it's always going to be me. <laughs> I love Australia, except I have a big problem with the beaches. The girls all go topless on the beach in Australia. That's just the way it is. And of course, the guys, you'd love it. But I am American. I'd never done that. I was afraid. 
Things cross my mind like, I don't know, they've never been in the sun, they might catch fire. <laughs> But I was really careful. I wore lots of sunscreen. I taped the bottles to my body. <laughs> and everyone said, Rita, you know, you have to go nude sunbathing because then you don't get tan lines. What good is a tan without tan lines? <laughs> How do you show it off to your friends? What do you say? Look, compared to my eyeball, look how tan I am. Too much sun is supposed to be bad for you. It's supposed to make your skin leathery and wrinkly and old. I used to look at those gorgeous 16-year-old girls just baking themselves on the beach and think, fry, you homewreckers, fry. <laughs> I don't like getting older, and I don't plan to grow old gracefully either. I plan to have facelifts till my ears meet. <laughs> surgeons. I was going to have my nose fixed. This is a true story, but I was sitting in this guy's office and on his walls there were all these pictures by Picasso. <laughs> I started thinking my nose may not be perfect, but it's centered. <laughs> I could wake up, it could be in a guitar. I never liked the way I looked when I was growing up. I have curly hair. I always wanted straight hair. I used to ask my mother to iron my hair. She hated to iron. She used to put me in the hamper and leave me there for weeks. Nobody's ever happy with what they have, though. People with curly hair want straight, and people straight want curly, and bald people want everyone to be blind. I was adopted when I was growing up because I don't look anything like anyone in my family. I look a little like my grandmother now because I have brown hair and blue eyes and she has blue hair and brown eyes. <laughs> That's my mother's mother. She's a very tough cookie. Really, she buried three husbands. And two of them were just napping. I'm an only child, which means I was very overprotected. My tricycle had seven wheels. <laughs> and a driver. <laughs> My parents wouldn't even push me on the swing. They wouldn't, they'd just sit me on the swing and run back and forth and say, it looks similar to this. fun for me either. It wasn't that no one asked me to the prom. It was that no one would tell me where it was. <laughs> Sexually, I was very ignorant. Other kids were covering up their hickeys. I was painting mine on. Everyone said, what does Rita have on her forehead? team because for the tryouts we had to ride our own cheer and I don't get that excited I wrote if we win we win if we lose we lose really you could deal with it I didn't go to college I moved to New York to be in show business and and I love New York I had an apartment right off Central Park I couldn't actually see the park but if I concentrated I could hear the screams for help my parents worried about me, so they went out and bought me a dog for protection. You know what they bought me? They bought me a Lhasa Apso. I guess they thought my ankles were in danger. <laughs> if you don't know what a Lhasa Apso is, I'll tell you, it's a very small dog with lots of hair, and it's very difficult to tell which end is which. <laughs> I was very upset when I'd found out I'd been trying to teach her to sit by shoving her head to the floor. <laughs> she was very nervous.
years, and that was my fault, too. When she was a puppy, I left her alone sleeping with a clock wrapped up in a blanket. You're supposed to do that. They think it's a mother's heartbeat. I'd forgotten I set the alarm. Every time the phone rang, I had to scrape her off the ceiling. <laughs> you know, the smartest dogs are poodles. Poodles. And I read that they're getting smarter. Soon they're going to be able to talk. And they're going to say, stop cutting my hair like that. <laughs> what are we doing? Those aren't haircuts. Those are landscapes. I wonder if other dogs look at poodles and think they're members of a weird religious cult. <laughs> if I were to get a dog again, I would get a seeing eye dog or a guard dog or a hunting dog. You know why? Because I don't have enough time to spend at home with my dog. I'd feel guilty. I'd just feel better if I had a dog that was involved in a career. <laughs> of careers before show business got going. They were, weren't very challenging. I was a stewardess for a while on a helicopter. <laughs> there were about five, six people tops. I would say, would you like something to drink? You would? Then we're going to have to land. <laughs> the most boring office job in the world. I used to clean the windows on the envelopes. <laughs> now I work for myself, which is great, except when I call in sick, I know I'm lying. <laughs> I do love doing um, comedy, but you travel constantly. I'm always in hotels. I was in a Howard Johnson's once. Their slogan used to be, I'm not making it up. If it's not your mother, it must be Howard Johnson's. That was their slogan. I was staying there. I called down for room service about four in the afternoon. I was hungry. They said, no, it'll spoil your dinner. <laughs> the maid came in every morning. She said, clean up your room. checking out, the lady behind the desk said, go ahead, leave, doesn't matter, I'll be dead in a couple weeks. <laughs> I just bought my own house. Well, I bought it last year when I was single. So you know what it had to say on the deed? Rita Rudner, a single woman. It looks so lonely. I said, can't you at least put, I have lots of friends? I had to go get a mortgage by myself. That was scary. When I was first on my own, I didn't know anything about money. I used to sign my checks, love Rita. Everything gets so expensive when you buy a house. Really, my last credit card bill was so big before I opened it, I actually heard a drum roll. Money. You know what I can never do? Ask for money back after I've loaned it to a friend and they forget to return it. Isn't that tricky? I can never ask for it back. The most I can do is when I'm over their homes, break something of that approximate value. <laughs> It has charm. I wish it had a window. <laughs> now, my husband and I live there now, and it's got two bedrooms, and the guest bedroom is really small, but it's still big enough so our parents can be comfortable if they come to stay, so we're making it smaller. <laughs> Certain things I can't get used to about having my own house. I've never had my own washing machine before. We've always gone to laundromats, so I still sit in front of it. <laughs> with a magazine and a gun. <laughs> I've been trying to get
get a CD player, but I just can't bring myself to buy one until I have something in writing that says that's the last thing they're going to invent. <laughs> so glad you feel that way, because really, if I were to buy that and they'd invent something else, I could snap. <laughs> I could become one of those people who wanders the streets mumbling to themselves. In fact, that's who I think all those people are. Those are the people who bought eight-track tapes. <laughs> One part of my house I don't use all that often is the kitchen. Um, so I, I'm not a good cook. I take after my mother. She was the worst. She once made carrot cake. She didn't grate the carrots. <laughs> she baked them whole into the cake. She even left those green things hanging out the sun. She said they're cake handles. was in high school. It was in home economics. I made a tuna casserole. I entered it in the science fair. <laughs> I won. I combined tuna fish, cream of mushroom soup, and potato chips. I got electricity. <laughs> Second prize went to a Japanese kid who made a robot who ate it. It died. I think I figured out why Japanese people are all so smart. You know why? Because they have to be to learn their language. It's very difficult. They have to be brilliant to learn how to write it. You've seen that writing. You know what must be very difficult, I was thinking? To be a skywriter in Japan. <laughs> He doesn't really cook, he barbecues. That's different. <laughs> Men will cook as long as there's danger involved. <laughs> I'm trying to get him to eat healthier. It's not easy. He hates health food. He thinks health food is anything he finishes before the expiration date. <laughs> I used to be a vegetarian, but I quit that because it has side effects. It does. I found myself sitting in my living room starting to lean towards the sunlight. <laughs> I'm always on a diet. I have little tricks, little dieting tricks to help me. Like if I order a dessert, I'll only eat half of it. But sometimes if it's a good dessert, I'll order two. <laughs> my favorite diet is wear big shoulder pads that makes your hips look smaller. <laughs> shoulder pads, I wear them with everything, really, even strapless dresses. <laughs> Sometimes I forget, though, and I get shoulder pad buildup. I do, well, once I remember, I put on a blouse that had shoulder pads, and then over that, I put on a sweater that had shoulder pads. And then I topped that off with a jacket that had shoulder pads. <laughs> I walked out of the house, my mailman tried to tackle me. <laughs> I'm a little compulsive about my weight. I weigh myself every morning. What I do is I slowly lower myself down onto the scale while hanging from the shower curtain rod. <laughs> and when I reach the weight I want to be, I black out. <laughs> boyfriend was a workout aholic. I mean, he was in great shape. And you know what I found? Men who are really, really physically fit are really tired. <laughs> they come home and they go to sleep and you get to look at them. And you think, gee, he looks good. <laughs> he could only move. My husband's not real romantic, however. He was so scared about this whole marriage thing. He gave me this ring on the condition I wouldn't call it an engagement ring. 
I said, I'll call it a can opener, just give me the ring. <laughs> and then I thought maybe I should go with him to get the ring, because you never know what they're going to come back with. And the worst thing you can say when someone gives you an engagement ring is, you wouldn't happen to have the receipt. He did great, though. I love my ring. It's an antique. It makes it that much more special to me, knowing that someone didn't want it anymore. <laughs> I love jewelry. I just don't think you should put it in your nose. You can if you want. It's a free country. But really, once, once you pierce your nose, no one will ever listen to anything you have to say again. <laughs> You'll talk and people will just look at you and smile <laughs> and think, Jesus, that must have hurt. <laughs> My dad was so happy I didn't marry a man who had a pierced ear. That's all he was concerned about. I think men who have a pierced ear are better prepared for marriage, really. Well, they've experienced pain and bought jewelry. My mom gave me some good advice, I think, when I got married. She said, just don't try to change him. Whatever's wrong with him, use it to your best advantage. <laughs> like my dad's sleepwalk. She never tried to change it. She just started handing him the vacuum cleaner. <laughs> the proposal wasn't real romantic either. With my husband and I, you know what he did? Well, I'll tell you, he'd been drinking. It's the truth, so he didn't get down on his knees. He got up on his knees. <laughs> it's hard to say yes when they've got their shoes on their hands and they're pretending they're a seal. <laughs> and he's younger than I am. I never thought that would happen, but, well, he's two years younger than he thinks I am. was marry an older man because they're more mature but the new theory is men don't mature marry a young one <laughs> we do get along great we have a lot of fun the only time we argue is in the car we argue about when to put gas in the car he has two beliefs in life basically he believes in God and he believes that when the gas gauge is on empty, he still has a quarter of a tank. <laughs> he thinks the E stands for, eh, there's still some left. <laughs> and our other problem is we're the two least handy people in the world and we married each other. We have to call someone over to unwrap soap. <laughs> I bought a TV table that you had to assemble four pieces of wood and some screws. I came back. It was as if there had been drunken monkeys in the room. <laughs> there was glue on the ceiling. <laughs> One window was smashed. His clothing was in shreds. I said, I guess it put up quite a fight. <laughs> and of course, he was proud of what he had made. Yes, he said, look, firewood. <laughs> but we need firewood because we have a fireplace now. All those romantic evenings, we sit in front of it trying to get it lit. <laughs> We can't do that either. Our neighbor's house caught fire. We went next door. We said, how did you do that? <laughs> he came home with a staple gun the other day. I knew I'd be calling an ambulance shortly. <laughs> but it's okay. He loves his staple gun. He staple guns everything now. There is nothing loose in our home. <laughs> there are a few major changes. For instance, now we have to bring the food to the cat.
It's a joke, it's a joke, don't get upset. Um, but I could say it because I don't like cats. I, uh, thank you, I think they're a waste of fur. <laughs> it's just that you never know what a cat is thinking. It's usually thinking, I could just jump on her head and ruin her life. <laughs> so now I have a house and I'm married and you know what's next. I don't know if it's going to happen. I get such family pressure about children. Like my grandmother keeps asking me, when am I going to be a great-grandmother? I keep saying, I don't know. I guess as soon as you do something extraordinary. <laughs> I'm American. He's English. What will our children be like? I guess they'll be rude but disgusted by their own behavior. I can have natural childbirth. It hurts. <laughs> and I don't know if my husband will come in with me well, and do that whole bit. I asked him if he'd be in the room with me when I had a baby, and you know what he said? It would have to be a big room. <laughs> and there would have to be a bar at one end. <laughs> but that's how men participate now. They come into the room with you, and they say, Breathe. Is that really sharing the experience? If I ever have a baby, I want my husband on the table next to me at least getting his legs waxed. <laughs> One bikini wax, he'd be dead. <laughs> and our only big problem is he doesn't want to wear a wedding band. I know, so we compromised. I said, it's okay, he doesn't have to wear a wedding band. He could just wear our wedding pictures on his forehead. <laughs> I knew that staple gum would come in handy. Thank you very much. Good night.